Good morning. Uh, so the talk I'm going to give you right now is really more about uh, what I do as a professor here in the department and sort of how to head off in that direction. Although, as just mentioned, I am the director of graduate studies. I have uh, some opinions, pretty strong ones, on some of the things that, uh, some of the questions that you just asked, Dr. Uh, Dean Byerly. Um, and I'll come back to those things at the end. But please, uh, if you want to ask any of the same questions, you might even get different answers uh, to some of those things. But I'll sort of come back to things that qualify you for graduate school and some of that process uh, at the very end. So this is sort of who I am. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, uh, my, my experiences as a marine biologist, sort of how and why I got to be uh, doing what it is that I do, and a little bit about some of that work, uh, and then sort of wrap things up with sort of general qualities that I think sort of match people uh, to the profession that I've taken. <coughs> How do I move this thing? Go that way? There we go. Okay, so I'm a marine biologist. Uh, what I do is study uh, uh, biological processes, living things uh, in animals that live in the ocean. And so there's a certain image of what a marine biologist uh, does that's been brought to us through the, the popular press and the, uh, and the arts. Uh, and that image goes something like this, that we spend all of our time in these tropical places. And this is all going to be illustrated, actually, by real photos of people in my lab. So this is my former student, Ron Aton, uh, who's now at Yale University and a postdoc. But this is Ron off in the Bahamas. And so you stand there on these tropical islands so you can't take the heat. You, you don your, uh, your scuba gear, uh, head off into the gentle lapping surf. Uh, where you drop below the surface, you see all these pretty colored animals, uh, the corals, the sponges, the sea fans, and all the fish that swim in and amongst them. Um, and of course, these animals are excited to make friends with you because they recognize you uh, as a marine biologist. So this is him uh, with a squid here coming up to be pet, something that you know, none of you could do because you, know, you haven't got your degrees yet. So um, th th and that doesn't extend just underwater. Here's a happy sea slug with my student, oh, ow, there we go. My student, Alice Dennis, uh, uh, playing uh, with a sea slug on South Padre Island, uh, a majestic animal to be sure. Um, and then he, this is a, a, at a, a park in uh, Guyana. Uh, where I, I got to you know, pet on a friendly sea cow uh, or manatee. Uh, the, I talked to a woman at the park who didn't know what they were called, but did know that they were very tasty to eat. Um, the, uh, and then the other thing you're always doing uh, in these situations is you blast around in fun boats. This is going up uh, the uh, Mazaruni River in Guyana. Sometimes they're not power boats. This is uh, Alice again going around mangroves collecting snails in Florida. Uh, it, uh, and of course, even when you're in the boats, the animals can you kill, kill the lights up front so I can see the dark slides? Is there any way to do that? No? OK. Well, you'll have to trust me that there's four or five uh, uh, sea turtles there gathering, uh, eating the watermelon that we had for lunch off the coast of Ecuador here. Um, uh, after all this fun in the sun, it's just too much. And so you spend the rest of the day napping uh, out in these boats. Or even whether you're back on land, even the dogs are tired of how much fun you're having. Uh, and then at the end of the evening, you have a wonderful hearty meal, get together and, and recount your wonderful happy day over a bunch of beers, making friends with, uh, with other scientists and with the locals and what have you. OK, so that's sort of the image of what we do as a marine biologist. And obviously, those are real pictures. That's some of what goes on. Uh, but the rest of the reality can be somewhat different. One thing when you're actually underwater doing these things, uh, you're not just floating amongst the fishes and taking pictures. You're gathering data, and that can be sort of arduous and difficult to do. Or you can be collecting animals. Uh, this, again, is my student, Ron, uh, picking up some of the small blennies, these little hole-dwelling fish that he worked on. Uh, this is a picture of one of the fish that he worked on, maybe half the size of your pinky, really small things. That, so while there may be big things swimming around you, you may be focused on other stuff. Um, this is some work that we did in Costa Rica, looking at densities of this one coral and doing some genetic sampling there. So we have to coordinate with people underwater uh, on a tight schedule. Uh, there was some bad surge here at this point, and one of my dive partners was pregnant, so she couldn't do some of this diving. We had to sort of make do with people. So you know, you, it actually does end up being work. And then the, uh, some of the animals that Ron collected then, uh, when he had to preserve some of these animals for genetic sampling. There, that's um, the, the, uh, these animals lose their color once you preserve them. And so you, before you put these things down, you have to uh, get uh, color photos of all these things. So we were staying up till one or two every morning before going out to dive the next morning at six again and keep on working these things. So you actually have to keep on working when you have this limited time out in the water. Not every place where you go is necessarily pristine coral reefs either. Uh, these are some clams we were collecting uh, off of uh, Trinidad a few years ago. Uh, does anyone know what La Brea means in Spanish? No Spanish speakers? La Brea tar pits in, in Los Angeles. La Brea means the tar. Uh, this is actually a point in uh, uh, Trinidad where there's a natural tar seep. And as you sit there in the water, there'll be like these three foot tall bubbles of black oil that will come up to the surface and just go blurp. And it kills all, almost all the animals, but the, except for these clams, which is why we were interested in, in them at the time. Um, 
the also, so aside from this collecting, the real work that we end up doing for 95% of our time is actually back here in Baton Rouge. This is my lab upstairs uh, in the old uh, life sciences building. Uh, and what we do in that lab then is essentially a get at the DNA that's inside these samples that we've collected from marine animals uh, and use that DNA detective wise in order to trace uh, um, things that go on that you can't see with your naked eye. Uh, so some of those things might be dispersal between populations. Marine organisms tend to have really tiny larvae that you can often not even see with your naked eye. And these are the main agents of dispersal. So you obviously can't be out in a big ocean watching little tiny things move hundreds of kilometers between populations. But their genes do leave a trace of these things. And that's one of the things we study. Um, also, uh, we can use uh, genetic markers to look at population size and estimate that from levels of genetic variation. And as you'll see in just a second, we can also uh, piece together past episodes of natural selection on particular genes uh, by looking at changes in the DNA. So to do all these things, then you have to get in the lab and do these genetic analyses. This is a visiting professor from the Philippines working in my lab. So a lot of things going on at the bench just molecular biology wise. Uh, that the, more and more those uh, biochemical an analyses can generate tons and tons of data. So you spend more and more time on uh, computers analyzing uh, those data. Uh, and when they all come down to, then I'll just give you some a little uh, story, sorry about that, about what we actually, one, one little story that comes out of some of the lab that we, work that we do in my lab. Uh, this one on sort of the um, uh, evolution, uh, evolutionary interactions between, uh, um, that are related to uh, sex and mate choice uh, in marine invertebrates. So this is sort of a picture of, of uh, how complicated uh, mate choice can be in humans. You have these sort of dances going back and forth that may or may not, uh, not mean uh, um, um, much uh, in the big scheme of things because ultimately uh, in an evolutionary terms what all uh, things come down to is whether you have fertilization whether you produce offspring that can be a difficult thing in things like humans where you have all this kind of pomp and circumstance uh, surrounding mating it's a lot easier in the ocean uh, where this is essentially a, an ongoing uh, orgy of marine invertebrates right here what looks like a bunch of cigarettes sitting in an ashtray is actually a bunch of tube worms uh, they're releasing sperm and egg up into the water so this is the sperm and egg of a number of different individuals mixing in the waters off Southern California. Uh, and assuming that these individuals all spawn at the same time, which is often the case, uh, whether or not these things are going to be able to mate with each other, whether or not there's going to be fertilization and the production of offspring, all comes down to interactions of, on the proteins of the sperm and the egg. And that's some of the stuff that I've been looking at in some marine snails. Uh, in particular, these ones, if you've ever been out to the uh, west coast and looked in tide pools, you've probably seen hermit crabs in shells, and 95% of those shells come from the snails that I work on, uh, things of the genus Tegula, a little kind of algae scraping uh, little guys, so essentially intertidal cows uh, that move around on rocks uh, and scrape up algae. And the big thing here is that they are free spawners, so they spur throw their egg and sperm up into the water column. So what happens in, with that egg and sperm is sort of outlined here, and this is going to sort of give you a rationale behind why it is that I look at the particular proteins that I look at. So before fertilization in these snails, uh, uh, this is going to be the egg proper right here. Before fertilization, there's this tough uh, layer outside called the vitellin envelope that's raised up off the egg's surface. So for any sperm to get through and actually contact the egg proper, it first has to get through this outside layer. So the sequence of events that goes on with sperm uh, meeting the egg then, first the sperm is going to adhere to this uh, outer layer. And when it does that, it undergoes what's called the acrosome reaction, in which this internal vesicle in the sperm's head, the acrosome, fuses with the sperm's plasma membrane and dumps its contents out onto this vitellin envelope layer. Now, inside this acrosome, the main protein you find there is a protein called lysin. And that's what I'll be talking about in just a second. And it's this protein, lysin, that uh, non-enzymatically dissolves the vitellin envelope in a species-specific way. Uh, and that allows the egg to pass, uh, the sperm to pass through and fertilize the egg. So if we want to understand about the interactions between males and females, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is the interactions between this lysin protein ah, and the vitellin envelope uh, that surrounds the egg. So what's that look like? Well, I just want to tell you a bit then that we did isolate this protein lysin. Uh, and what we found is that it evolves very, very differently uh, from, say, typical genes, like this is just a section of a gene from the mitochondrial genome called cytochrome oxidase 1. Uh, this is just for a comparison. I'm comparing the divergence of two closely related uh, Japanese species, uh, just for, uh, as an example. So if we look through uh, and compare about 210 codons of this mitochondrial gene, we see 28 silent DNA substitutions, that is, changes 
to DNA that don't change the protein sequence. They, they are at silent sites, and so in the language of DNA, uh, they still say the same thing. So they don't change any amino acids, uh, nothing gets replaced. Um, with uh, a far, well, a, with about two-thirds the length of uh, this sequence here in lysine, we see uh, um, about four silent substitutions. That's a lot fewer, but we expect to see more higher rates of change in the mitochondrion because it doesn't repair its DNA so well. But the kind of shattering thing is that we see a ton of these amino acid altering substitutions, uh, and they result in a lot of replacements of amino acids. So in this case, these two species that have diverged only about three million years ago uh, have had, uh, whatever this is, 25 divided by 140, uh, around 20% or so uh, of their, um, their amino acids have been replaced. And it, this makes this one of the fastest known evolving proteins of any animal. Uh, next. Um, so we can sort of compare uh, these different rates of change. Uh, we now have uh, sequences for this lysine, uh, as well as for um, the, what we think is the uh, protein, the section of the protein that it interacts with from the vitellin envelope layer. Uh, and then we have a section of that same protein from the outside of the egg that does not interact with the sperm. So if you look at this section right here, you'll see that it evolves a little bit slower than this CO1, which is sort of a, a kind of housekeeping gene that we often use for comparisons uh, from the mitochondrion. So when they're 5% divergent at this CO1, they're less than 2% divergent in this part of the egg protein that is not involved with recognition. However, at the same time, we can get, with that just 5% divergence of CO1, or about 2 million years divergence time, uh, we can get 15% divergence at this egg protein and huge amounts of divergence uh, at this lysine protein. So these uh, sex-related proteins evolve far, far faster than just your average garden variety proteins uh, in these animals. So we know that they evolve very, very quickly, but why? Why do they, do they, are they more mutable or is something else going on? Uh, well, we can actually use information from the DNA sequence itself to figure, to answer that question. Uh, specifically, and there's something that's, there's supposed to be a code on here that's disappeared, which must have been a uh, GTA by the looks of things. Um, we have these two different kinds of, of um, changes, as I mentioned before. Some that are synonymous, oops, synonymous, uh, Synonymous changes, that is, um, if you change the third site on many codons from a GTA here to a GTC or a GTG, it doesn't matter. It still means valine in the language of the genetic code. However, if you change a first site or a second site, that does matter. It changes the amino acid that's coded for. And so what we can do is look at the ratio uh, of, of these changing substitutions to non-changing substitutions and account for the number of changing sites and non-changing sites that we have. And in most cases, what we expect to see is that, by and large, for most housekeeping genes, most changes are not going to be a good thing. The cells in your body do largely some of the same things that the cells in bacteria do, uh, and so that most of the, your DNA sequences are pretty good off at w with what, doing what they do right now, and so you're going to see a lot more silent substitutions than changing substitutions, and this ratio will be less than one. In contrast, the interesting thing is when you have uh, um, to me, anyway, is when you have DNA changes uh, that, are, that favor amino acid changing substitutions above and beyond silent substitutions, and that's called diversifying selection or positive selection. So what do we see for these proteins? The upshot is that we see a lot of positive selection. So this is that lysine protein, the male protein. Thank you very much. Um, no, 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 I'm getting my hand. So um, the, um, this, this ratio right here, again, is one of the highest known for this male protein, uh, uh, this, this very, very high ratio here, uh, significantly different from one. Uh, even higher for the part of the egg uh, that's involved with uh, recognizing the sperm, whereas this turns out to actually to be not significantly different from, uh, from uh, one overall. Uh, and, uh, so we don't see selection actually on the uh, uh, area of the egg protein that's not involved with sperm recognition. Okay, I'll just go this, I'll do this manually. Thank you. Um, so that we know now that it's positive selection that makes, uh, makes these sperm egg recognition proteins go so fast. And for future work, what we're trying to do is look at uh, trying to catch some populations that may be on, uh, in the act of moving towards forming new species by looking at very, very recently uh, diverged populations where these sex proteins may be uh, um, 
spinning apart and, and therefore forming new species. Okay, so that's sort of something of, of um, what it is that I do, uh, both in the general sense as a marine biologist, in a particular sense in my particular lab. So I want to give you a little bit of my history then of sort of how I get, got here. This may or may not uh, um, relate to your own particular histories, but sort of outlines uh, some, you know, at least the basics of where it was that I came uh, from to, to do this kind of work. So this is where I started out. Um, at Sharp Hospital, I was a sharp baby in San Diego uh, a long, long time ago, born at a painful time in the morning to my mother. Um, that means I grew up in San Diego, so I grew up around the water, and this is actually a place I still go back to, and my son and I went, got to spend some, a few weeks surfing back here uh, this very, very summer. Um, so I grew up around the water and was excited about those kinds of things. This is my, gosh, I don't know, it's my third or fourth grade birthday party or something like that. So it was a geeky kid that got to go out in uh, boats and catch little mackerel there. Um, I also grew up really close to the border, and so I had a real interest in Mexico. Uh, th this is, a, this is a Avenida Constitucion before the uh, narco-traficantes took over it. I uh, spent a lot of time here growing up. Uh, and then also the first place that I sort of fell in love with as a, 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 a for going fishing and for marine biology and things like that was this little town of, of San Felipe, home of the fish taco, uh, which is more or less the same as it was back in the 70s when I first went there. Um, the other big influence in my life is I had parents that really in encouraged my curiosity. Uh, my dad was a college professor. My mom taught English as a second language, among other things. Uh, and so I got my sort of start as a nerd really early on. This is a, my birth an announcement ran off on a mimeograph uh, from my dad, the college professor, and who could only relate to things as when you could have the little uh, ring diagrams on them and things like that. So I sort of came by my curiosity and my interest in teaching and learning uh, kind of honestly. And I, I started working in oceanography at a really young age. Uh, so this is actually something I was, I was just cleaning out stuff at my mom's house, uh, just with stuff that was lying around. And I found these embarrassing things like, uh, like this oceanography report from second grade or something like that. And it had this little thing, too, about what it was that you wanted to be. Uh, and yeah, I was going to be an oceanographer in, you know, for all these great highfalutin reasons. Um, so in some ways, I show this not just to humiliate myself, um, although that's, a, you know, that's always good. Uh, the, the other thing is just to so, show that in some ways, what you want to have is that kind of childish enthusiasm for what you do. There's nothing wrong with having that. That's something that, uh, in my own teaching experiences, when we take animals out to like see 11-year-olds, they're all excited. They have all these great questions. You, you put them in front of 19-year-olds, and everybody stares at their shoes, checks their iPhone, and tries to get the hell out of the lab as soon as possible. So that I think they're somehow socialized, somehow when hormones kick in, we're taught that we're supposed to subvert any kind of enthusiasm we have for anything we might have cared about when we're 11. And to the extent you can get over that and get back to things that might have made you excited uh, um, before there was the opposite sex, um, that, that you, know, you don't have to throw those things away, but, but there are other things to be excited about in life. Uh, and so to try to remember some of those things. As far as my background went, uh, I had a vision growing up in, in California that, the, that if you were really smart, you had to go off to the East Coast and wear leather patch jackets uh, it, you know, to, to get a degree. So I went to Johns Hopkins where those things weren't, you know, that wasn't the case. <laughs> but um, so I'm not there anymore. Uh, I came back to the West Coast uh, to UC Davis to do my PhD uh, and then uh, down back to San Diego to do a postdoctoral study. Um, so th things to point out here, uh, people had asked about how long this took. Actually, I did my undergraduate in three and a half years, so that's less than most people. Uh, this was a, just kind of a big, I didn't know what I was doing for a long time. So in answer to that one question that someone had somewhere over here about how long things took to finish up, it, uh, so much depends on how much focus you have, how much experience you have uh, coming in, and like, like uh, Dean Byerly said, uh, how much your major professor guides you towards finishing early. I think that's a really important thing is to look at and ask blunt questions of a potential advisor about how long it's taken their past fit students to finish up. Because now in my, in my um, Sorry, work as uh, advisor in this department, I can tell you that it's pretty much a lab signature how long it takes people to finish up. Most people have a characteristic finishing time for their lab, and it's not easy to change that. So if somebody says you can finish in four years and they've never had a student finish in less than six and a half, you know, talk is cheap. So ma make sure you, you really look into that. Um, so as far as in my work history, uh, as I mentioned, I had three years of, uh, as a postdoc. A postdoc really is sort of like this weird thing where you're kind of working. Uh, and you're kind of not. You're kind of looking to move on to a professorship, but at the same time, you can start to get paid 
you know, decent money. Uh, I, you know, not maybe compared to people that go on to be physicians or something like that, but you can certainly get by. I also have strong disagreements with the idea that any graduate school student should, for any reason, should ever take out a student loan. You shouldn't. It, it limits your freedom in future life. Debt ties you down uh, in ways that no date debt, uh, you know, no debt and you're free. You can take jobs that don't pay much. You don't owe anything to anybody. Uh, debt is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. And so you can get by in graduate school. I never made more than $8,000 a year in graduate school. I always had a roommate. I slept in the car a lot of the time. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I was absolutely free to, to pursue whatever I wanted to do, wherever I wanted to do it uh, when I got out of school. I didn't have to worry about paying anybody back. I had a weird uh, history where I, with my, as when my wife got a job here at LSU, I came here as an instructor first, eventually changed to an assistant professor and moved on up the line. Um, and so as far as personal qualities then that I look for that I think were important in, in uh, my success to this point and that I really, really look for in potential graduate applications, both for my own lab and for the department. The number one thing by far is curiosity. I don't care how bad your high school background is, how bad your family background is, how poor your language skills are because you come from another country. All those things can be overcome with hard work. But if you don't care about what it is you're applying to do, if you bought into society's things like, oh, I'm spaced out, I don't know what I want to do with my life, maybe I'll go to graduate school. Okay, I don't need that. I don't want that. I want somebody who may not know the particular thing they want to do, but at least is curious about the, the, you know, the subject that they say that they want to study. I can't teach you curiosity. I can't teach you to care. You know, and that's, that's the number one requirement. Everything else we can somehow find for you, but curiosity has to come from you. So that's by far the most important thing I look for in a graduate student. I mean, from that curiosity then comes self-motivation. Uh, you occasionally get students that are curious but not self-motivated. They like to know about stuff. They, they're good students in their classroom sense. That they like to sit and listen to things or watch nature films. But when it comes to getting into the lab or doing things themselves, they can't get that self-motivation. So that's something, the curiosity sometimes will spring towards that, but at some point you actually have to be self-motivated to get some things uh, to work. And then finally, the last thing is communication skills. Again, I think this is another thing that, that, uh, that we're poorly served by stereotypes of uh, scientists being these, uh, you know, um, uh, oh, glass-eyed geeks that sit with white lab coats uh, and work in dark places with nobody else. Uh, that's not science. If you go out and discover all these great things uh, and you sit home in mom's basement and don't tell anyone about it, you are not a scientist. The whole part of the process is getting your findings out into the public domain where other people can see them, can evaluate them, and that knowledge gets pushed on into future generations. You're building on a global body of knowledge. To do that, you've got to go out and you've got to give talks. You've got to be able to compel people to give you money for your work, which means writing grants. Uh, you've got to write compelling papers where people understand what it is that you think that you've shown and you make a compelling case uh, from your data that you actually have shown that. And to do that, you have to have communication skills. So it doesn't mean, again, that you have to have this great background right now, but you've got to understand that that's something you have to work towards, at being good at giving talks, at being good at writing papers. And it's a really important thing. And, uh, so the advice that I've got you know, as far as uh, uh, looking at future for graduate school and, and, and uh, just whether it's something you want to pr uh, pursue going to become a professor or something like that, uh, one of course is, is then again go after the things that are most curious to you. Uh, th that um, it, you don't necessarily have to, I, I wasted a lot of time trying to find one thing that was ideal. Um, just anything that really interests you, get into that and it often leads to other things and as you, you learn more and more you can pinpoint more and more what it is you want to do, but you should really be interested uh, uh, in what it is you're doing. And I say at least some of what you do, a, a fair amount of what I had to do, I mean, you know, I have to turn in papers to, get, to, to and receipts to get refunds for this and that work. That's not part of the part of my job that I love, but there are, you know, aspects of it that I do love and make sure that there are at least that, some of that going for you. Another piece of advice would be to, to keep doors open. Uh, this comes from a lot of times people, um, especially more, more high school students talking about going to uh, just to their undergraduate degree, want to get degrees in marine biology, which is what I do. And I really discourage that because at that point when you're 17, you just don't know enough about what the world is out there. So when in doubt, aim for broader kinds of, um, 
subjects, and you can always learn to specialize later. If you head off and specialize really, really early, it may be difficult to change course later. So to the extent that you can, keep doors open by sort of uh, 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 keeping things as broad as possible for as long as possible. Uh, but, you know, and part of that then is that staying flexible and realizing that there may be opportunities that come up uh, and so you don't necessarily rigidly have to decide what it is you want to do when you're six uh, and then stick with that. And that's all I've got for right now. So I'm happy to take any questions you might have, both about what I just told you now and about other things about applying for graduate school. Thanks. That's so right. Let's I can wait a with. long time. I got a snack before it comes. <laughs> I, had, I, had, I had almonds, you know, not, non toasted, no grease. I had a question. Next. Yes, where are you? you got a oh. I'm in Shreveport. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, first of all, you're really cool. Uh. And, uh, <laughs> the life oh, of yeah, yeah, Ask my son about that. I'm not sure. So. Um, just go by what I say. Okay. I think you're cool. Um, the Life Aquatic is my favorite movie, so <laughs> you got kudos for that. But um, one my of arch enemy's named Steve too, so it sort of works out that. Yeah, oh, knows. that's perfect. I need to yep. try that out. Um, my big problem is that I'm a worrier, and I was wondering if you should let your innermost dreams let that worry kind of fade away. Uh, I, I'm certainly. I mean, I think a lot of people that that. Um, both as a graduate advisor and as a faculty member, I, I, I and I've, I've, before I worked in university, I've worked in restaurants, I've worked in construction sites, and I think there's a lot more neurotics at the university than there are other places that, that I think that people that are into pursuing their curiosity often live too much in your head, their heads, uh, and that makes for a, a anxiety and, and the kinds of things, worrying that you're talking about. Uh, and, but I mean, I think the worst thing, uh, the worst, way to feed those kinds of anxieties is just to sort of sit back and continue to overthink things. So uh, the best way to move past them is just to do the next thing and to, to try to pull out of your head and just do the next thing. So rather than overthinking things, like I said, I spent a lot of time trying to come up with the perfect project as opposed to going with some really good things that were in front of me and then just letting those go where they went. I eventually took that course and it really served me well. So just go with the next step that's in front of you and uh, worry more about doing the next thing than uh, worrying about figuring it all out forever till the end. Uh, and you know, it'll uh, just come that way. So yeah, I, I, I feel for you, but I, the, the step would be to just, you know, just do the next thing. You're just awesome, thank you. <laughs> stop, stop, you're killing me, okay. <laughs> yes. So as far as things go, is it, should we be spending all our time in the lab doing our research or are we trying to well-rounded people. I, 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 that's a good, it's a good question. The question is about how much time you spend in the lab. And again, I think it's really important to address your advisor and what they expect. Uh, depending on the university, depending on the personality of that individual, some people really want to see, they want to be able to tell the, the professor senior to them, oh, I had three of my students in before 7.30 this morning. It's really important them to have that body count. Other people, they don't care when they're around as long as they're getting things done. I mean, there's other people that don't care at all that just want to have a list that they have 10 graduate students and they never get anything done. I mean, there's all kinds, I mean, the way you find out these things to me, I think, is just if you can talk directly uh, to previous graduate students of that lab pe and talk to them in a context where you haven't got the professor sitting there when you think they can really give you the straight scoop. And you may not hear the same story from every single one of those people. Some may have had good experiences, some not, but you're sort of, evaluating how well your attributes match to what goes on in the lab. So I, I you know, certainly with my own students, I have a student that, that her family's in Lebanon, she wants to go back every six weeks every summer. I have no problem with that. She's been able to coordinate some of her research which now goes on in the Mediterranean with that family stuff. So I think there's ways that you can sometimes find stuff that you want to do personally and integrate that with your work. Uh, but again, find out from the professor. Some people, it's really important that you put in a 60-hour week and that they see the lights on whenever they come in. Other people, it's really going to be all about, um, you know, just what you get done. I will say 
that when you try to do something hard and it's not working, then there's going to be no su substitute for putting in the hours because it's going to be really hard to convince somebody, well, you know, I can get a lot done in 30 hours a week, although nothing's working now. That doesn't sound so good, you know, and, that, and, I, and I think that some people, that is sort of how you flesh out the people that, that are in this kind of, I don't know what I want to do, so I guess I'll go to graduate school mode. And I, I personally feel as an advisor, it's important to get rid of those people as soon as possible. Not necessarily just to purge our system, but because those people aren't going to succeed. Uh, you've got to have some kind of drive. You've got to have some kind of passion. If you're not showing it when you have the opportunity, it's just you're better off knowing that soon as well as you know, the lab knowing that soon. So it, it really is about the match. Uh, there certainly are labs. I knew people that only worked 40 hours a week and were stellar graduate students who got you know, really, really good jobs. Uh, and did great, but when they came into the lab, they were ultra focused. That's what they did. And other people sort of hang out in labs sort of as a lifestyle kind of thing, and they some of them do fine too. It's just so it really is whether your style matches that of the lab you go into. Yeah. Okay, I feel like a lot of. Uh, people's ambitions for their future career is built by what they're surrounded by as a child. And mm -hmm. for you, like where you grew up, yeah. that kind of gave you the idea to be a marine biologist. But how do you feel now? Like how has it met your expectations versus um, what you wanted? And would you have maybe considered something else in life had you not grown up in San Diego? Something else besides being a professor or besides the, the, the particular subject that I work on? Yeah, because I, I think as a professor, I think it just, I, I, I talk way too much, I think a lot, I've always liked animals. I think that part uh, would probably stay the same. Certainly subject-wise, one of the big strategies I had uh, for being a marine biologist was that, that, that like, pff, I mean, I'm never going to be that far from the ocean, right? So, I mean, when I was a postdoc, I was literally 100 yards from the beach. I, every, I could surf every afternoon for lunch. Baton Rouge, it hasn't worked out so well. Um, but, but at the same time, you know, as, as, you, as life goes on, you, you change your priorities. And at some point, the priority was living right by the beach. And now the priority is, is working in the same building as my wife where we can both do fulfilling work. And, and as far as the biology, as I've learned more, I mean, more, it, it's not like I get more and more focused in my interests. I, I, I want to know more and more. And there's so many things in biology now that, I, I mean, I was really good at math at one point. And I just sort of dropped that. And now the, the, the opportunities for math by biology or computation by biology are just staggering. I mean, there's so many cool things that you can do. And you can, you know, and there's a lot of jobs out there for that. So I, I, it's, it's, it's the more I know about biology, it's, it's, I, I, it's not that I regret my choice. I just see I could have made a lot of other really good choices, which again, I think gets back to that person that was asking about how when they're trying to figure out exactly what's the right thing to do. I don't think there is one right answer. I think if you get into it and you, it can, it can, something can continue to uh, uh, um, uh, you know, meet your interests, there's lots of other choices to do. I mean, coming around, now that I'm in, in Louisiana, I mean, leeches are fantastic animals. You can do, I mean, they're ultimately cool. There's ones that feed on blood. There's ones that feed on fish. That means you have to evolve things that stop blood from clotting really quickly with inside the leech lineage. That stuff actually has medical uh, uh, importance because there's things from leeches that kill pain. There's anticoagulants. There's, uh, there's vasodilators. There's all kinds of stuff. And this is just leeches that we could pull out of the lake right there. I mean, you have a whole career for stuff that you could pull off the bottom of a turtle at the lake, uh, lake and just you know, play with that leech for the rest of your life. So I mean, there's, there, so there's, there's just cool things all around when you look into them. And so I, I, the fact that I start, I mean, I still, wanted to, I still tend to want to work on things that are in Mexico that are marine. That's just sort of where I came from. It's what, what interests me most. But it's not like if you dropped me in the middle of Ohio, I would just sort of shrivel up and die and say there's nothing interesting to do here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so differences between marine biology yeah. and oceanography. Right. Could you uh, clarify that? I, in it? some ways, in my mind, the difference is if, if, if you can still see land, you're a marine biologist. If you're, you can't, you're an oceanographer. I mean, I don't, I, I don't sort of, uh, I, there's an oceanography department on, on campus, and I think there's a lot more concern about physical processes and like plankton and just sort of these mass effects of how the ocean works as a system. Whereas, really, what I do, I mean, I'm in a biology department. And I don't really t tend to write much in marine journals. So what I'm doing is I'm really working on the evolutionary biology and the genetics of animals that happen to live in the ocean. So I know that environment better, but the environment that I know is all 
the ocean 60 feet and shallower. And so it's, uh, it, it, and, but I was, I was, when I was at Scripps, which was a big oceanography study place, still the difference between the biological oceanography department and the marine biology department, who hated each other. Uh, I, I couldn't figure out why some people were in some and some were the other, and I swear you could have just re-scrambled and put them in the different departments, and they still would have found reasons to hate each other just because they were fighting for resources. So the line is not always so clear, but I'd say largely it has to do with uh, one of the big differences is usually about ships. So, yeah. <coughs> I have not, and I think that, that at some of the animals I work on, like corals, there are enormously a, and conf very confusing uh, morphologies where what one paper we're writing up right now, what's been called three different species uh, uh, of this spe a very common coral in the Caribbean, turns out genetically just to be one. They're all intermingled. But they look really distinct, and they've been described as distinct for 100 years. I wouldn't be uh, surprised at all if epigenetics is an important part of that. But at this point, I mean, I don't think there's even a project on the horizon. That's a word now that gets, it's flashy and, it's, and uh, it's exciting. We have people in the department who do those things that I would love to collaborate with. But it's, yeah, this is exactly what I was talking about, that, that as, as you know more and more, you run into, more, oh, that would be so cool to do. And at some point, you're doing 20 different things and none of them are getting done. So, so I, I try to focus not because I'm not interested in other things, just because at some point, you've got to get things done. But, but you're right, I mean, that's, like, that, that's a fascinating, you know, directions that somebody should be headed in uh, sometime in the future. Other, other questions? Great. Well, help me thank okay. Mike. Anybody, any, qu any other questions? You can always find me and uh, email me, and I'm happy to, to, to give people advice or anything in particular about graduate school or biology in general. Thanks. <laughs>